I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Today, uh, our topic is Effective Assessment Techniques for Successful Athlete, Team, and Program Development. And we're going to be starting the webinar in just a moment. We'll give everyone a chance uh, to uh, log in and get settled and dial in. While we're waiting for everyone to log in, I want to go over a few housekeeping uh, items. As attendees, you are tuned in to the audio portion so that you can hear it, but you cannot speak uh, on the presentation. We do have a question feature that I'll go over in a moment. If you're listening through your computer and you experience any audio difficulties, please write down the, this number. Looking back up for just a second. Please make sure you write down this number. This is the call-in number for the conference call. Uh, if you do have issues listening over your computer, you can dial in and the audio should be better, again, if you experience any difficulties. There is a question and feature on the control panel to the right of your screen that popped up. If you do have any questions throughout the what presentation, please type that into the uh, question section, hit enter. Some of the questions will be answered by, answered by the presenter during the Q&A session. Some questions will be answered in a type format. Following uh, the webinar, a survey will actually open up in your browser. If you could please complete that survey and help us do a better job as we select more topics and present more webinars to you, we would appreciate that. If for some reason that function does not work or you don't have time to fill out the survey today, one will be emailed to you later today, tomorrow, through GoToWebinar. And if you are interested in CEUs for this presentation, you must view the entire webinar and you must fill out a survey in order to qualify and be eligible for the CEUs. Once again, today's topic is Effective Assessment Techniques for Successful Athlete Team and Program Development. And we would like to thank the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for their generous support that allows us to put this webinar series on. This webinar is in partnership with the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. The NWBA and Blaze Sports have entered into a partnership so that we will present uh, educational sessions for the NWBA and wheelchair basketball in the foreseeable future. So please let us know if you have any specific topics you'd like to see presented in this format, and we will make sure to put that on the schedule in the future. Today's presenter is Doug Garner. I've known Doug for a very long time. We've done a lot of work together in wheelchair basketball. He has a wealth of experience, and I actually shortchanged him a little bit. I have up there, he only has 15 years of adapted sports experience. It's actually in excess of 20 years of experience as a coach, official, administrator, He's currently the head coach of the University of Texas Arlington. He's also the commissioner of the NWBA Junior Division. And as you can see, an IWBF classifier. Uh, Doug has a wealth of experience. He's at a great program down there at UTA. And we'd like to welcome Doug to the presentation today. And Doug, thank you for joining us and presenting on this topic. And with that, we will turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan. And uh, first thing I want to do is I want to um, I want to thank Blaze Sports for putting together this professional development webinar series. I think it's great. It's something that's very needed, and uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. And of course, uh, uh, taking the initiative and partnering with NWBA is very exciting. Uh, just a couple things to add before we get going. I got into disability sports because of um, I had a son who was born with spina bifida. So I also bring a, a perspective of a parent Who's, uh, who's looking at uh, what are opportunities for my, uh, my kid out there, for my son or daughter, uh, and also from an educational perspective working in the field of education. So um, I kind of have a lot of hats in, uh, in this recipe here. So I'm excited to be participating. And uh, I just want to uh, go ahead and move forward here with this presentation. Uh, uh, I never was a real fan of assessment. It, it was never, um, it was always something I looked at as you have to do this until I uh, really started looking at things here at UTA and I really started looking at talent development and uh, talent identification and development. And uh, somebody asked me once at a tournament, what do you look for in an athlete? And I thought, well, you know, everybody knows what you look for. Then I thought, well, how can we break that down? How can we break that down? as coaches, um, as 
professionals who are dealing in talent identification and development. And so basically using assessment, we're looking at nothing measured, nothing changed, nothing gained. And, and what we're saying is, uh, if we don't know what we're looking at, how can you measure it and fix it? How can you measure it and take it to the next level? And so that's what we want to do, uh, is take this to the next level. In fact, Peter Drucker, the, uh, the famous management guru, said, what gets measured gets managed. And that's kind of what, uh, what we want to do. And I take this scenario here because it's happened to everybody. You have athletes who come to your practices. And they're, they're all over the spectrum of age, ability, uh, disability, uh, talent, development. Um, and you as a coach, as a professional, you have to look at that and say, oh, OK, how can I best come up with a learning management system where I can help every athlete reach their potential? And we all know it's really hard sometimes because you have all these outside pressures coming at you. You have pressures to win. You have pressures from Susie's parents who want her to be an all-star. And you have pressure from your program. And you have pressure from your sponsors. And then um, you have the pressure that you put on yourself. So if you have a system, if you can develop a system that's going to focus on, number one, what we all look at, long-term athlete development. Um, and you keep that as your philosophical foundation for your coaching, then you can be successful. And assessment can help you get there. Coming up with some assessment tools and techniques can help you get there and help you get to that next step. So what is assessment? Uh, and a lot of people have some miscommunication um, and misideas about what assessment is. Assessment is a process. It's not just going in and measuring, uh, OK, well, we're shooting 27%. That's not assessment. That's part of the process. It's a process about collecting quantitative information, information that you can measure. It's right there. It's the stats that you're keeping. That's part of the quantitative information. The score on the board is quantitative information, but that's really not a valuable assessment tool sometimes. Why do we conduct assessment? To improve educational programs. Um, and that's the key. Improve our programs and improve our talent and improve our teams. And it's an, a way to demonstrate your program effectiveness. If you have a good assessment tools and techniques, you can take these to your sponsors. You can take these to your boss. You can take these to your kids, your athletes' parents, and say, hey, look, this is where we are. This is what we're measuring, and this is where we are. We, uh, we have done X hours of programming this month. We have served X numbers of athletes this month. Um, your speed has gone from 5.6 seconds to 5.2 seconds. Those are quantitative numbers that you can work with and address in your training program. And so that comes to the next step. Does not take the place of teaching. It's not all assessment driven. It is, um, it is a tool that you use to see where you are. So you don't necessarily come in and do assessment every single week. You define your goals. You use your training system. And this is your educational program, is your training system. You use your progressions and your regressions if you're not achieving your goals. And, and then you use those steps to address the success of the athlete and the development of the athlete. I think we really have to change how we look at ourselves as professionals. We have to get past the, the connotation of the coach being the person out there yelling and um, uh, really pushing and, and all that. Um, we are really, we're the chief learning officer of our programs, the chief learning officer of our program. Um, and so we have to have a learning management system, an LMS. That is our system of educating our athletes and helping them to reach their potential. And again, back to it's, it's focused on long-term athlete development. And that's even at the college level, that's what we have to keep in mind. So we're in the business of talent management. Coaching is teaching. Teaching is talent management. And that's what we're doing. So we need assessment 
to help us know where we are. What do they do in the schools? They use assessment. It's called test. You go through a unit, you take a test. Now, where they miss it sometimes, in my humble opinion, in the schools is they take that test and then they move on to new information. And so, in that way, assessment is not used in the right way. Okay, we found out what you know, but we don't go back and help you learn more because we have to move on to new information. In our practices with our teams, we can change that. We can assess and go back, see where our weak spots are, and then we can use our learning management system to meet those needs and to help our athletes get better. So it's on the focus and intention of what you're doing and to compare across the field. So we can set our goals. We can find benchmarks to set our goals for our athletes. And then we're going to use our system to address that. And what I mean by a benchmark is what can we expect from an eight-year-old as far as their dribbling? Um, is 6.9 seconds from baseline to opposite free throw, is that a good time for uh, a nine-year-old boy who's been injured for two years? And that's one thing that makes it kind of hard for us as disability sport coaches is we have such a wide spectrum of age, disability, uh, disability age, uh, sport experience, but we also lack really some benchmarks so that coaches can get into coaching and say, okay, you know, most nine-year-olds should be able to do this. That's one of the things that makes it difficult along the way. Um, but you can't really have effective assessment and ex effective learning if you don't start trying to develop some benchmarks. So what we do in our program, we develop benchmarks on strength, on speed, on agility, on shooting percentages. And we go back to those and we say, hey, compared to this team in 2006 that won the national championship, where are we on speed? Where are we on strength? Where are we on shooting percentages? And then we take that forward. OK, assessment is a tool for delivering believable value. And I think this is really cool. Um, it aligns people to your goals. It helps coaches identify areas of improvement. And also, if it's done, if your goal setting is done um, correctly, it aligns your athletes and your parents of your athletes into your program because this is where we are, this is where we want to go. And when you get there, you can show this to your parents, you can show this to your sponsors and say, look, this is what we've achieved this year. We might have only won two games, but our speed improved, our shooting improved, um, our strength improved. That's the long-term athlete development. And so then if you do have it, maybe you don't have the talent to win a championship. You're at least showing them that, hey, we're making progress. We're getting where we are in our training programs. Um, your program can use assessment for grants. You can use it for sponsorships. You can uh, use it for your annual reporting. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can use assessment to bring everybody together, your front office, your athletes, your parents, and your coaching staff. And I'm not, this is not to devalue the uh, qualitative stories about how important sports is for uh, young people with disabilities and how uh, after two practices, um, Susie was so much more confident and so much more outgoing. Those are certainly have value and they certainly have a part in your reporting, but hard numbers are really what you can use to sell the success of your program. OK, I, I go by the iceberg theory of coaching. And um, the hard part of assessment is looking at where we are. OK, this was our speed per person for our team. How do we fix that? How do we make it better? And really, to take your assessment numbers and to do something with them, you have to look at the, the whole iceberg. And if you see an iceberg like this picture here, I love this picture, 
there's a, a little bit of the iceberg above the water, but the biggest part of the iceberg is under the surface of the water. It's the things you can't see. And those are the things that we as coaches have to be able to break down a skill and look at. Okay, maybe they aren't the fastest athlete on the court. How do we break that down? How do we look at all those little squiggly things underneath the surface and address their speed development? So a lot of times, especially new coaches, will look at what they can see. Uh, let's say they're missing their shots. Okay, you're missing your shots. We need to shoot more. Well, that's always that's a symptomatic treatment. What do we need to do? What are those things, the squiggly things under the surface that we need to do to help fix that? So what I've done is I've included some of the um, goals and objectives that we use here at UTA as a template for people to uh, to look at and. Um, I did this presentation at the Paralympic Leadership Conference, and some of the feedback I got was, well, everything you, you showed us had to do with basketball. But what you really have to do is be able to break down the principles of what we're talking about and apply them to your sport, because everything I say can be applied to another sport. So keep that in mind. Um, so this one is, uh, this is one of our goals and objectives for our program, grade point average. Okay, if we're not reaching that 2.75, what do we have to do? Those are our action steps. What do we have to do? And every semester, I have to pull all this up, and I look at this, and I say, okay, we're doing good, or okay, some people are doing good, or what do we need to do to um, help our athletes be academically successful? Because, one, they're probably not going to get a job in wheelchair basketball, so they need a degree to go forward. And, and that's a big part of, some of what some athletes don't understand when they come to school here and um, what we need to keep in mind as we help them through their college years. Another one here is, uh, and this is kind of a benchmark, um, are our athletes being successful at a national leather level individually? Of course, we have team placement at the national tournament and during the season, our record. But how does this um, break down to our athletes' success? And so one way we measure their success is are our athletes uh, doing well enough individually and uh, improving enough to be recognized for national team trial uh, invitations, for uh, All-American honors, for academic All-American honors for all-rookie team. So what I, I have to look at in the action steps there, you'll see those are the little squiggly things. What are the things that we think are important that are going to help our athletes be recognized at that level? Speed and agility, number one, one of the most important things. So we measure, we assess speed and agility, and we train for speed and agility. We don't just measure it, but we look at it, we baseline compare it to other athletes, speed and agility, and we make that a priority in their training. Same thing with scoring averages. Um, same thing with, you know, I have cognitive skills here, but it's all it's really uh, decision making skills that that we look at um, to measure how successful and how our athletes are developing. Um, there's one a program goal: increase the economic support base of our program. How are we going to do that? Well, here's the steps that we try to do. How do we know when we're successful? 25% in the last year. Did we increase additional funding for our program by 25%? And if you look at the bottom, it says SSC. That is stop, start, and change or continue. So every year when I present my report to my bosses, I say, this is we're going to stop this, we're going to start this, we're going to change this, or we're going to continue without any changes because um, because it's been successful as it is. Um, a learning outcome here that we use is uh, speed and agility. So we measure baseline the opposite free throw. We time it at the beginning of the year, and then we look at where we are compared to where we've been in the past where 
national team athletes are pushing. We look at some of their testing results from national team tryouts, and we say, are we where do we want to be? And then we look at how are we going to get there. And so we have a speed program that we use. We have agility drills that we use. Um, we have conditioning because strength is part of speed development. And then we evaluate those at the beginning end of each season, and we discuss them with our athletes. Um, communication cues for um, recognizing um, nonverbal communication. Okay, how do you recognize nonverbal communication? Body language, chair position, hand position on the wheels, uh, mismatch position. We ask all these. Um, all these cues that we want our athletes to be able to recognize on the floor when they're playing which are basketball, which will affect their decision making. And so at the beginning of the year, we talk about this. Okay, I want you to really work on recognizing nonverbal cues. We talk about it in practice, we address it in drills, and we talk about it at the end of the year. And we see if they have much more, much better understanding at the end of the year of the nonverbal cues that we think they need to be successful. So we look at where we are in our assessment, um, let's say speed, and we say, what do we need to do to get better? One, we look at general fitness. Do they have the strength to push at that speed? Do they have the uh, body composition to push at that speed? If they're overweight, then that's one of the things we talk about. Look, you can be faster if you weigh 10 pounds less or if you can uh, increase your bulk in your chest and shoulders. So we look at the general fitness of the athlete, including core stability and um, range of motion and balance. We look at their sport-specific fitness, which we've talked about. We look at their knowledge of the game. Um, not just do they know it, but do they comprehend it? Can they use it? Can they see it when they're watching other people? Can they watch film and see it in, their, in themselves? That's all part of their knowledge of the game. Um, we look at, of course, sports-specific skills that we feel like they need to be successful athletes. Um, we look at sports-specific applications, um, picking. Uh, a lot of our decision-making, I assess decision-making by looking at our success in um, numerical advantage situations. How many times in our drills are we successful in a two-on-one, a three-on-two, a four-on-three? To me, that's a way I measure their decision making. Are they making the right decisions? And really, I think this brings a holistic coaching perspective to, um, to coaching. Uh, you have to look at everything other than just the outcome. You have to look at all the little things that make up the outcome and decide what do I want to measure that's going to help us reach this goal of being faster, uh, of being a better shooter. Um, a lot of times you see, okay, we're going to do more shooting, but and then next week we're going to measure it again. You can't leave out that middle step of teaching shooting, coaching shooting, teaching technique, fixing the smaller things uh, like on this that, that are going to make up success in that specific sport. And I think those are the, the things that um, that assessment can really help you do to break down the skills that you want to see and break down the, the talent that you want to see on the floor individually and team-wise, take it to a point where you can measure it and then start teaching. Uh, it's almost like teaching to the test. Start teaching things that you want to do that are going to help them uh, be a better shooter, be a faster athlete, uh, have better defensive skills. That's huge, good defense. Okay, and there's, there's the rest of those, the sports-specific skills. Passing accuracy, very easy to assess passing accuracy. Ball handling, we do, uh, we have a, a cone course, a dribble course that we do, and we, and here's something that's very important too, we tape out the course on the floor so that the cones, if they're knocked over or somebody else is running the test this year, the cones are in the same place every time because you can't compare apples to oranges. You want to assess speed, you want to assess 
ball handling or agility, then um, it has to be the same every year, or you don't have a good um, you don't have good feedback, and you don't really you, you don't have your benchmarks to compare to because the course was different. So we'll set up our cone course. Um, we'll give our verbal instructions on the sprints. It's the same way every time, so that um, so that our athletes can be compared to the year before, and we'll have a good idea of, is our program working? Is our training program working? Is our strength program working? Is our um, muscular um, conditioning program working? Uh, there I mentioned uh, psychomotor domain, uh, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, the, the different domains that are important in breaking down um, your skill development and in uh, helping to set up your assessment program. Um, um, so that's that's in a, a slide coming up. Okay. Here we have uh, what's called a uh, hierarchy of development, and this is in um, the cognitive domain. Uh, I used to think. When I got players here at college, oh, they know the sport of wheelchair basketball. They know the rules. They know uh, how to do this. They know how to do that. Um, but that would lead to sort of certain frustrations along the way, if you know what I mean, uh, about players not getting things. And so I really had to step back and say, OK, where are we in our cognitive means um, knowledge of the game? And uh, one of the things I did this year that was really important, I gave all our guys, um, it was interesting, I gave all the guys on our team a um, the referees test for the NWBA. And I thought, all right, this will be interesting to measure their knowledge of the rules of wheelchair basketball. And it was one of my goals and objectives that I have to report on coming up. And um, much to my surprise, only one athlete passed the officials test for the uh, NWBA. Um, so I was a bit surprised there. And uh, it let me know in doing that, oh, we need to talk about different rules a little bit more. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Sometimes players get upset about a call or about um, what somebody else is doing. And um, so it told me by using that simple tool, OK, we need to talk more about the rules of the game and how the games are going to be called. So that was kind of interesting. And that's just the very base level of the hierarchy. After that, they need to understand. Uh, they need to understand what makes a good pass. They need to understand how do you shoot a ball with good technique. Um, not just know it, but can they act, do they actually understand it so that they can do it? And the next step would then be apply it. Can they apply? what they know to being a successful athlete, to being uh, a great defensive player. Uh, they may know it all day, but if they can't do it, then you need to reassess your training program. OK, so they know what they're supposed to be doing, but they can't do it. What do they need to be able to do to, to do that? Do they need to be stronger? Do they need to be faster? So your assessment tools, they can tell you that. You say, hey, uh, tell me what good defensive position is. Show me what good defensive position is. OK, you have good defense on John, but you can't stop Tommy. So what do you need to do to be able to stop Tommy and help them break that down? And when you do that, when you put it out there in that way, they can see the specific things they need to work at. Um, it could be seating position. Uh, it could be. Um, that they just need to clean their chair. Those are the little squiggly things that, that we're looking at um, to help them reach their potential. So you start ruling things out along the way. OK, new chair. OK, great seating position. Maximizing strapping, maximizing uh, balance and stability. Still can't do this. What do we need to do? Lifting program, uh, training program, chair skills programs. Those are the things. OK, now we're going to uh, go into a lifting program. A month later, 
Are you stronger? Has it, how does that affect your game? <clears throat> and then at, at the higher levels, analysis, synthesis, uh, evaluation, um, that's where film comes in. Can the athlete watch film and see what they're doing and make corrections? Can the athlete watch another group in a three-on-three -three situation and understand chair position and make corrections in their own game? Uh, one of the things that I think you can do with your older athletes is have them watch maybe a two-on-two -two shadow and give feedback. And by teaching, it helps them to break down what they're looking at. You know, for uh, for me, I've always been kind of a forest thinker. I, I think you have your forest people and your tree people. And your forest people are the people who see the forest. They watch a game and they go, oh, that's a great game. They, they see the forest and they say, oh, look at all those beautiful trees. Um, they watch a game and they say, wow, that's a fantastic game. They watch a practice, oh, that was a great practice. Um, they watch a skill, wow, that's fantastic. Your tree people are the ones who actually see the individual components of that particular skill, of that particular game. And I've been coaching for, I've been coaching youth sport for um, 30 years now. And um, for a long time, I started out, I was, I was coaching gymnastics, and I was a very forest thinker. And to, to learn how to break down gymnastic skills, well, that took some time. And one of the things I did was I took an, a ref, uh, uh, judge's test. And that forced me to think in ways that judges think as far as looking at individual skills. Um, so I would say to coaches out there, you want to be a better coach, become an official and officiate some. Uh, go to classification clinics and learn how classification and functional capacity affects what players can and cannot do. Um, watch good teachers and good coaches and look at the specific things that they do that apply to their uh, talent identification and development. So I went a little bit off, off base here, but uh, what we're talking about is the cognitive development of the athlete, teaching them the components of the game, teaching them the verbal cues, the nonverbal cues, and um, here's the easy way to look at that. What are the things you want them to know? Uh, can they take that information and use it in a useful manner? Can they then apply it? Can they take um, speed and agility components and skill sets of speed and agility? Can they apply that in a game situation? And then finally, when they're in a game situation, are they able to use it at the speed of the game? Uh, a big thing we see going from high school players, junior players, to college players is this last level right here. They can do it at this speed, but taking up to the speed of the game at the college level and then beyond that to a, a national team, international level, that's where the thinking, um, the cognitive part of the game really gets behind in some of the athletes that we see is that they can, they can process it at a certain speed and then to go to the next level, they need to learn how to think that fast. Um, so it's very, very interesting um, as a coach to start breaking that down and seeing where they are and then helping them get to the next level. An area of training that I think a lot of people don't really think about is the affective domain of your athletes. And basically the affective domain is um, their communication, how they think about themselves as a person, their relationship skills, their relationships, um, all those are very, very important in affecting physical play. Uh, when we recruit athletes, one of the things we look at is coaches say, um, if, if you listen to Coach Frogley and the coaches, uh, Coach Thompson and Coach Shavers, all the coaches at the high school to college transition session, they say, number, th number one thing we're looking for is good kids. Okay, cool. Let's break that down. What is good kids? Okay, we have to break that down. And really what we're looking at are kids who are good communicators 
And that's the first two steps there in the affective domain. Can they receive information openly, especially uh, criticism, and can they respond appropriately? And these are the very base levels. You can't even get to the higher levels of affective development, relationship skills, unless you can do those first two things. And um, I know when I look at athletes, and I'm talking to athletes, one of my informal assessment tools is do the athletes, uh, the junior athletes or the, the other athletes who are interested in our program, do they communicate with me? Um, is it mom and dad who are calling, or is it their coach who are calling, or do the athletes come and communicate directly with me? Because um, part of growing up, part of developing as a person, not just an athlete, but as a person, is learning the skills of receiving and responding. So you coaches out there and parents, if you're not, if you're doing everything for your athletes or your sons or your daughters, if you're communicating for them, then that's a skill that they need to learn and work on just like dribbling or shooting. Um, uh, one of the problems a lot of the athletes that I watch in juniors and even at the college level have is they're still struggling in the receiving and responding area. Uh, they can't really get to that next step on that until um, they can't start valuing other people's communication and they can't start um, appreciating their role in the team until they can receive and respond information. So uh, sometimes something simple as just shooting percentages can be affected by their development in the affective domain. So before you start running off and uh, trying to fix their shooting, look at, okay, why are, in shooting drills they can shoot 60%. Why are they having this problem? And we had this come up on our, our college team. Good guys who were passing up shots or not shooting at all uh, or not shooting well. And it turned out that they were afraid of what other people would think. They were afraid what somebody would think if they missed, what somebody would say if they missed. Um, and so instead of verbalizing that, they started questioning their shooting. And as you know, as coaches know, you cannot have a good shooter who's questioning their shooting. Uh, so. We had Jay Nelms in practice one day, probably one of the best shooters in the country, and we just said, Jay, what do you think about when you're shooting? And he said, all I think about is do I have an open look? And so that's one of the things we've really worked on is our players not questioning what are other people going to say, what are other people going to think. Um, if my job is to shoot, then I'm, I've got to shoot. And so I think something really to consider is uh, addressing the affective development of the athletes um, and looking at where they are. And an easy measure for that is do they make eye contact? Are they polite? Do they appreciate things that other people do for them? That, those are some uh, informal assessment things that I use to look at that. You've got to get moves. I get caught up in little things and whew, get off track. Okay, uh, psychomotor development, you know, you look at imitation and manipulation precision. The bottom levels of this are rooted in very, very basics, dribbling basics. But before that, even strength basics. Do they have the strength? Before that, do they have the functional capacity to dribble with both hands on nom uh, dominant and non-dominant hand? Um, so it's taking their psychomotor development and breaking it down all the way down to, to functional capacity. Is this something I can expect from an athlete with this particular disability level? And then you come up with the skill sets that are necessary for that particular skill, for dribbling, for pushing. You look at speed. Um, we look at acceleration deceleration and linear speed. So tie that all together. Um, changing directions is part of speed. Uh, we all see the athletes who are super fast, but they crash into anything that crosses their path. Well, that brings in the cognitive area. That brings in the affective area of seeing other people and their relationship to other people on the court. And that brings in the psychomotor level of 
where they are in their uh, their power development, their pushing technique, things like that. Looks like we got about ten minutes. Um, basically, what I'm saying here is know your athletes, know them on the court, know them off the court, get to know them by talking with them. Um, let's take shooting in the environment, practice shooting. How are they in practice shooting? And, and that's called open set. There's no factors other than shooting. And we do spot shots. And I think the, the spot shots chart is in this uh, presentation later. Uh, can they hit 60, 70 percent? Um, and then take that and go through the stages of shooting where you add other variables. You add time. Okay, can they shoot 60 or 70 percent? when they're shooting against the clock, uh, when they're competing, if, if you make it a competition, can they shoot the same thing? Because if you're trying to go from practice shooting, open set, to game shooting, closed set, it's entirely different. We look back at the 2016, they were shooting in their open set, practice shooting spot shots, they were averaging 80%. That translated over to about 60, 56 to 60 percent game shooting. So. Um, for these athletes who think that they're going to be shooting 60, 70, 80 percent in games, here's your benchmark right here. Are you shooting 80 percent in your spot shots in practice? Because if you're not, it's probably not going to transfer over to your game shooting. And then you look at range, the physical factors. Maybe they didn't sleep last night. Um, maybe they had a, a really busy day. Maybe they have testing in PE at school. All those things are factors that affect the, the physical factors and environment in shooting. Then the psychomotor factors, throw in technique, throw in their functional capacity, um, throw in handedness, type of shot, cognitive. Do they know? You know? Do they know what is beef? What is the elbow position? What is the hand position on the ball? Sometimes we assume that, and we're operating under a false assumption. They really don't know. And you tell them, and they're like, oh, wow. I've never heard that before. Um, it's really surprising sometimes when you say that and, and you get that response. It's like, wow, I've, I've probably said that 20 times in the last week, but now they're like, oh, I've never heard that. And then the affective factors, uh, confidence especially. Do they have the confidence? Um, what, and motivation is interesting. You know, do they, are they motivated? Are they motivated to be a great athlete? Sometimes we assume that our athletes in practice, they're there because they want to be great national team athletes. Well, there's a lot of things that affect their uh, motivation to be there. And you have to understand that as a coach to understand, are they going to put the time in on this? Um, and so now you start evaluating, OK, you know, they're here for the social part, and we have to balance that. Uh, Self-efficacy, do they see themselves as a good basketball player? Do they see themselves as a good shooter? Uh, are they having relationship problems with parents or with boyfriend, girlfriend? All those are things that affect performance, that you have a coach, uh, you have to start looking at. These are the squiggly things under the surface here that you have to start uh, taking into account when you're looking at your assessment and how you're going to come up with your learning management system and your program for athlete development. And then we create a chain of evidence. We, we set our goals based on what we think are realistic, uh, smart goals. Um, based on uh, benchmarks that we have, what other athletes uh, with similar functional capacity are shooting, uh, and say, okay, here's our goal. This is what we're going to work toward. Then we, we, then we start just breaking that down in the chain. In practice, how are we doing that? What's the next step? Okay, we're shooting 80% on spot shots. Now let's put it uh, in a time. Can we do 80% uh, spot shots 8 out of 10 in 3 minutes? getting your own rebound, start putting a time in there, because then they start rushing their shot a little bit. And then when they're consistent there, then you add another variable like, OK, the competition, the winner of this competition gets um, to drink, get a drink of water first. Um, you, so you start breaking down like that and adding different uh, variables that affect shooting mentally, affect shooting physically. Um, you do spot shot king, where they line up. They make the shot they're in. They miss the shot you're out. See how pressure affects them. Um, team shooting, where the team has to make five in a row. And then you start seeing 
how pressure affects them when you start. Number one makes it. Number two makes it. Now we're starting to get a little pressure. Number three, number four, and, uh, and so you start adding those variables to see how that's going to affect their shooting before they get in scrimmage situations and game situations. And then you go into the assessment cycle. Measure. Well, first your objectives, your, your SMART goals. Then your how are you going to measure that? Collect your data. Analyze it. OK. Now we make changes. Move on. Well, what do we do next to go to the next level? Or your regression. Say, we've got to back up. They're not getting better. What do we do when they're not getting better? Maybe that's not the right variable. Maybe it wasn't physical. Maybe it was something else. Break it down and pose, uh, look at those questions uh, and look at those results and see how you can back up a step and actually fix this on the next, uh, on the next assessment cycle. And um, that way you've got to be measuring the right things. You know if you're measuring the right things. And, and if you don't see change, if you're teaching, if you have a learning management system where you address that development in practice and you don't see change, then you back up and you look at why not. So I think real quickly, we can look at um, speed development. What's your goal? Be able to stop anybody on the team in practice. So we're combining speed and agility. So speed. What is it? If I want John to be able to stop anybody on the team, acceleration. What is acceleration? That's the power push. That's the first two pushes coming from a complete stop or coming from a, a deceleration and then a turn, the power push out of that. So we know what speed is. Now, what do we need to do? Are they strong enough to do that? Uh, do they have the right technique? I put push, recovery, pull. Do they have the right technique for their disability level to do that? Um, have they optimized their seating position? Maybe they need the knees up a little bit. Maybe they need to move a strap. So we're taking a simple skill like uh, speed and agility, and we're breaking it down into things that, why do you need to know all these individual things? So that you can make changes in your learning management system, and then see how those changes affect your final result that you're going to measure. How do we measure it? Um, we measure hand speed. How many pushes between? Baseline and free throw. Um, so we'll measure baseline and free throw. We will put the cone course out there. Um, now we're looking at beginning of practice versus end of practice. How's your speed at the beginning of a two-hour practice versus at the end of a two-hour practice? Maybe we need to work muscular endurance. Um, transfer that over to track. How's your speed at the beginning of end of practice? What is your first 10 meters? What is your last 10 meters? Um, how are we going to break that down to really fix what it is that we want to be able to fix? And that is, we want to be a defensive stopper. We want to be able to stop anybody on the court. OK, you're saying, uh, I've got 12 athletes. How can I fit this into my one practice two hours a week? I, I put interns first. Uh, we have a staff of one here. but. We go to the kinesiology office, and if most of you are near a community college or a college, and you say, hey, this is what I want to do. Do you have some interns in kinesiology who can help us be better athletes? And if you, if you say it like that, they're going to they're gonna have students who are interested in um, exercise physiology who will come out, and they'll do an internship with your program. And they'll help you set up an assessment system. If they're in pedagogy, teaching programs, they know about assessment. They'll be able to come out and help you set up an assessment system and help you measure, manage your content and your development, and measure again. Um, things aren't working. Uh, I think one of the things that's overlooked a lot is feedback. OK, we know where we are. We measured our speed. Now, feedback. They're not just going to come back next week and be faster. You have to give them feedback on what it's going to take for them to get faster. Um, you have to give them feedback on being a better shooter. You don't just do shooting drills, but you have to give them feedback on technique. Um, why is the shot long? Why is it to the left? And also, if you have charts, measurement charts, like shooting charts, it gets your athletes involved. Uh, if they're filling out a shooting chart for their home shooting or they're shooting at school, 
then they're involved in their own assessment. And they can look and they, they can see their own progress and they can say, hey, look, I, I've been at 40% for two weeks. Um, but that's motivating to them to see success, to see development, to see progress. Um, that's going to help with their motivation. It's going to help with their involvement. And it's going to help with your time helping each individual athlete. Uh, parent involvement, especially on the affective end. Um, have parents, and I know some junior programs that do this, they get involved and they say, uh, you know what, they were in trouble three times this week at school. If they're in trouble at school, that's, that's behavior that can carry over and affect the sports. So uh, something to consider and how you're going to address that because there's probably other things that are going on that are affecting their physical development and their basketball development. Um, and then breaking down to focus drills that are going to help. Communication is huge. And if you have athletes who aren't talking, uh, it's really going to limit their progress. Uh, and that brings us to the bottom line of the, the long-term athlete development. Um, what is our bottom line? To have happy athletes, athletes who are having fun, and athletes who are getting better uh, for their future. Uh, they're healthy. They're stronger. They're faster. And when they're, when they're like that, they're more independent. And they have better self-efficacy, better self-confidence. That's our long-term athlete development. Uh, this is an evaluation I use. I stole it from able-bodied sports. A lot of things we do, we steal from other people in other sports. I did this at the end of the season this year and said, OK, let's look at each of these. What are you going to do this summer to make this better? What are you going to do this summer to uh, practice shooting off the dribble? Um, and we broke everything down, and hopefully our athletes will come back this fall better in the areas that they were deficient. I just rated them one to five on each of these. Actually, what I did, I had each athlete rate themselves, and then we discussed where they were um, based on what they thought, what I thought, and what we could do to go to the next level. Um, this is good in setting a benchmark. This is what they call we call a 30-minute drill. We start. Anywhere that's not a free throw, you don't have to start at the top. Do this and see how long it takes you to complete this whole thing. And we use this to, for our in-season conditioning. Um, our better athletes are down around 18, 19 minutes to complete this whole set of skills. So a little bit of benchmark. Get your guys out there, put this on the wall where they can see it, and get them to do the whole thing and see where they are um, as far as conditioning. What slows most athletes down is making free throws. Uh, here's some benchmarks for t-test cone circles. Uh, email me if you have a question on our, our cone circles or the sprint, exactly what we use. I can tell you, you can see where your athletes are as far as maybe using this as a benchmark. I do this individual rubric with each of our players um, at the beginning of each season. We talk about where they are in their knowledge of the game as far as their cognitive domain. We talk about their affective development and where we both think they are, them and me. And we talk about their actual physical psychomotor development. And some of the things, this actually just takes it and breaks it down. These are the things that we want to see to be successful as individuals and as a team. All right. I kind of left a little bit of time for questions here, so Dan. Um, we do have some questions for you, Doug, but first, thanks for a great presentation. That's all some great stuff, and I hope everyone uh, tuned in, uh, got a lot out of that because there was some great information there. Uh, first question, obviously, you coach uh, a collegiate program. Uh, most of the people, if not all the people uh, on the webinar, coach community programs. And within a community program, and you coach a community program for a number of years, you know that you have athletes and players that come in at any point during the season. And the question was, when you have those players come in, do you always assess them right at that point when they first come in to the program? Um, this is what I would do, and I base this on my years in gymnastics. We would have girls move in or join the program, and we would have a one-on-one -on -one session with them to do an assessment when they came in. Uh, and that way, the coaches working with them know where they are, and they know where they are, and it's a good time for you to go over the program expectations 
and the significance of your skill development. So you can say, look, in our program, this is what's important for our team. You've got to be fast. You've got to be quick. Um, you've got to be able to dribble with both hands. You've got to be a good passer. And here, we're going to see where you are, and this is going to help us develop a training program for you to get better in those areas. So I think it's a great one-on-one -on -one opportunity to have an athlete come in early or stay after practice, a new athlete, and just do an assessment and see where they are, go over it with them and say, these are the things we're going to work on, and we're going to test this again at the end of the year and see how much better you've gotten. Uh, we've got another question. I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit for you. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I get to the gist of it, and if I don't, uh, the person who asked the question, type in another one and we'll get back at it again. But okay. for, again, for community programs, they're using program chairs. And when you talk about um, assessing and developing speed and agility, a big portion of that is the proper, uh, the proper chair setup, proper balance, proper strapping. But when you're using program chairs, it may be hard to achieve that optimum seating position and strapping and balance. When, when you have that issue, does that change what you're looking for in terms of utilizing assessment tests for speed and agility? I don't, I don't think it does. I think it just gives you an idea of measuring where they are because that's, that's exactly true. Most athletes are going to come in um, and use a program chair. But at least you can find out where they are in that chair and then you can address that. And if they're getting faster or quicker, or their turning is better, they understand turning more uh, in a chair that doesn't fit them then that's just going to help them down the road when they are able to get a chair that does fit them. So you work with what you have, and if you have this chair and this is the best fit chair we have for you at this time, then you work within those, uh, those constraints uh, knowing that whatever they do in that chair is going to help them down the road. Well, and Doug, I think you hit on a really important point there. And if I if I backtrack into the beginning of your your presentation, one of the first objectives for your program you discussed was an objective for GPA. Obviously, nothing to do with sport, but an important part to keep players eligible. And then you'd also mentioned that utilizing the scoreboard is not necessarily a good assessment tool. When you couple those together with what you just mentioned, and what you're basically talking about is, regardless of the equipment, regardless of how skilled the athlete is to begin with, what you really want to focus on is continual improvement. Can you just talk for a minute about that and then, of course, the role the, uh, that assessment allows you to play in, uh, in determining uh, continual improvement? Um, OK, I'm not sure I get the tie in there on, on grade point and school board. Well, the, well, the tie in is that you, you you don't always want to look at the outcome. There are other things to assess than the score on the scoreboard, who's winning, who's losing, who the best shooter is. What, when you talk about assessment in terms of individuals, what you're really looking for is what's their baseline and are they improving? And, and yeah. those are some of the goals that you want to look at and the, pro, the, the process goals and the performance goals that you want to set to improve that performance is where I was going with that. And, and bottom line, what what you said was as individuals, because it can be frustrating uh, on a team or if you're not a starter uh, to use some of those uh, outcome measurements. Uh, basically, that's why you do assessment to show the athlete who does get frustrated, hey, you are getting better. You're faster here. Your passing accuracy has gotten better. Uh, whatever it is that you're using to measure, you can show them, you know, it's not if you take care of the small things along the way, the big things will take care of themselves. And, and that's what we want the athletes to realize is take care of the little things. Take care of the small things that add up to those big things. Well, excellent. Uh, that is just about the time we have, Doug. I uh, want to thank everyone for attending. And again, uh, a, a, a survey will open up as soon as we close out of this webinar. Please fill that out. If you're looking for CEUs, you must complete that survey to be eligible for the CEUs. Uh, and if for some reason the survey doesn't open up, one will be emailed to you. The way we do CEUs is you will get a document at the end of the year that has all the available webinars we offered. And we can tick off the ones you attended. That way you can apply for all your CEUs at once. And we provide those CEUs through the University of Central Oklahoma. 
Uh, Doug, thank you so much for your presentation. Again, great stuff. Um, okay. I do want to mention one of the things that uh, Doug touched on many times is long-term athlete development. We do have a great presentation on our YouTube channel uh, that you can access free of charge that Mike Frogley presented on long-term athlete development and continue to learn a little bit, uh, continue to develop yourself as, as coaches. So we invite you to look at that. I will be sending out an email uh, in the next few days that will include a PDF of this presentation, a link to the archive on our YouTube channel that uh, can take you there. And then once you're there, obviously, you can search for all the other archived webinars we have on there. And again, uh, please feel free to uh, let us know what other topics you would like to see within this webinar series, particularly with our partnership with the NWBA. We want to make sure that we're providing all the information we can to help you guys run better coach, better programs, and be better coaches, and uh, serve your athletes. Once again, Dan, Doug, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, can, I, can I give out my email if anybody has a question that we didn't address or a specific Absolutely. question? Absolutely. Uh, my email is dgarner at uta.edu, and I'd be happy to follow up on any of this, answer any questions, or maybe or send some other information if somebody has some specific questions. And I will include Doug's contact information in the email that goes out with the, uh, the PDF as well as the link to the... Uh, to the uh, um, YouTube archive. So with that, again, thank you, Doug. Thank you for everyone for attending. And that will conclude our webinar for today. Thanks, Dan. Thank you.